welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer because I need it and I know you do too. So if you're able to stand, would you just go before the Lord in, in, in reverence and stand with me and we go, go before the Lord in prayer? Father, we just come before you today, Lord, and we're just grateful for the opportunity that we have to be here in the house of the Lord. We don't take that for granted, Lord. We don't come into this place just to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. Lord, we don't come to church for entertainment or tradition. Lord, we come to hear from you, and we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. Lord, it's in the name of Jesus that we ask your Holy Spirit would speak to us, to minister to us, to show us things in our lives and in the Word of God, to remind us of things. Lord, we thank you that Lord, that you would just bestow all the blessings upon us that the Word of God proclaims over us. And Lord, these blessings that we ask upon ourselves, Lord, we don't ask solely upon ourselves, but upon all our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ around the world and in the Inland Empire that are preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. At no time do we think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but rather as co-laborers all working together to build the kingdom of God for your glory. So Father, we thank you for our denominational brothers and sisters, our Presbyterian and Methodist and Episcopalian and Baptist and Lutheran brothers and sisters. Father, we thank you for our Catholic brothers and sisters, Messianic Jewish brothers and sisters. Lord, we thank you for our local churches in the area, Harvest, the Grove, Sandals, the Well, the Way, Ecclesia, Emmanuel Baptist. Father, we thank you for Crossroads, Abundant Living. Lord, so many churches in this area, too many truly to name, but Lord, we thank you that we are all many members of one body, that is the body of Christ, working together to build your kingdom for your glory. So Lord, we ask that all the praise, all the glory, All the honor would go to you in Jesus' mighty name. And we all said, Amen. 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 Wow, praise God. As you're being seated, go ahead and grab your Bibles. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews in the seventh chapter is where we find ourselves today. If you're just joining us or joining us online, welcome. We're so glad that you've joined us. Uh, We have been going through the book of Hebrews, line upon line, precept upon precept. The Bible was written that way, which means that's how we've been studying it. So we find ourselves in the book of Hebrews over quite some time. And here we are in Hebrews, the seventh chapter. I'll give you the title of this morning's message after we read the uh, text for today. Hebrews in the seventh chapter. If you've got your Bibles, go with me. If not, it'll be up on the overhead for you to follow along with. Hebrews in the seventh chapter, talking about Jesus Christ and the subject of our high priest. Hebrews, the seventh chapter, verse number 26. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and who has become higher than the heavens. Today we're going to focus in on that verse, Hebrews 7, chapter verse number 26. There's some truths, some thoughts there, and some things that I believe that when you and I grab a hold of the concepts and the precepts that the Word of God has pertaining to Jesus Christ, as well as you and I in our walk with Him, that we will truly be who God has called us to be. But there's some things that we want to talk about. First of all, we're, discuss, we're discussing the subject of the high priest. Now, that's a subject that you and I oftentimes have a hard time relating to in that we never grew up in a society where we had a high priest. We have representatives and things of that nature, so we kind of get the idea, but really it's, it's essentially different. Let me just give you the, the, the quick uh, understanding of what a high priest is so that we can not spend so much time focusing on that, but rather get into where we want to go with today. Simply put, a high priest was this. It was the representative of God to men and from men to God. It was the middle man that stood in the gap or stood in the, bit, in the balance between man and God. You see, there was a separation between Adam and Eve. And God and men were separated in the original sin in the fall of mankind. And the high priest was the one that represented mankind to God through the atonement and through the sacrifice for the sins, as well as represented God to man as the authoritative figure here on earth. Now, Jesus Christ has come and taken that role of high priest. It is no longer uh, due to a lineage or a uh, uh, um, Um, the characteristics of mankind, but now Jesus Christ has become our great high priest once and for all. So he is the one that stands in the gap. He is the representative of God to us and for us to God. Last week, Pastor Jim talked about him making intercession or pleading on our behalf. So today the Bible tells us about Jesus Christ, our great high priest. The title of this morning's message is this, Jesus, a perfect fit. Jesus, a perfect fit. You see, oftentimes when we look at the life of Jesus, when we look at the teachings of Jesus, the way, the will, the wants, the desires that Jesus has for you and I, 
We get into this mindset because of our fleshly, our our worldly nature to say, well, you know, there's no way that I can reach or attain the level that Jesus Christ is at. There's no way that I can live up to the standards that Jesus has set before me or has commended me to live my life as. So oftentimes what we do is we begin to say that just it just doesn't fit for me. It doesn't work for me. It doesn't fit into my life. But I love how Hebrews, before we can even get into the description or the characteristics of Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us in Hebrews, the seventh chapter, it gives us an unlocking statement or or, or a key, really, that unlocks the entire descriptive factor. And that is that it was fitted for us. Jesus was fitting for us. He is fit for you and I. If you think about it like this. If you think about the, the, the image of, of somebody, a Wall Street broker, or somebody in New York in those high-rise buildings, you know, whenever I think of Wall Street, I think of uh, a fancy clothes or nice suits. You think of the example of a suit. You can go to the department store and you can find your generic measurement. You know, I can say, well, my waist size is this and my chest is this and my arms are a certain amount of length. And you can pick something off the rack that fits to the generic template of a size. Or if you wanted to spend the money and get something done right, oftentimes what they'll do is they'll go to somebody who will manufacture or who will make a suit custom made or tailored to that person's exact dimensions. Because each and every person is different. And you see, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ was fitted for us, was fit for us. So we have this ability in our flesh, or we have this tendency in our fleshly nature to look at Jesus Christ and say, well, it just doesn't fit. But the reality is, is Jesus Christ, our high priest, our representative, our middle man between God and us, was actually custom tailored for you and I. You see, God saw our exact needs. God saw our exact dimensions. And he didn't just send a generic template to come and stand in the gap or to come and fill that role. But rather, God saw fit to send his son, Jesus Christ, to come and live and dwell on the earth as a man to experience life as you and I experience it. Therefore, he could also become custom fit. You see, God experienced the pains that we live through in our daily life. He experienced the temptations that we go through. So God saw so fit for you and I uh, the need that he said, I will send for them a representative. I will send for them an intercessor. I will send for them an ambassador between me and them that is so perfectly fit that it will fill every gap, every nook, every cranny of their life so that they have no more need for anything else. It is in Jesus Christ that we find everything we need in life. Jesus Christ was fit for us. Regardless of how dirty you think you may have been or how many decisions you might have made that were wrong or how you feel like you may not be able to live up to the standards of God, we will see today that through Jesus Christ, we have a perfect fit. And now we can wear the garments of God and the high priest and the representative of God that were custom tailored, custom fit for each and every one of us to fill every hole, every need, every desire that we have in life. So now we can be united and connected with God. Jesus Christ, the perfect fit. And in Hebrews, the seventh chapter, it gives us five descriptive statements about our high priest, our representative. And now we could go throughout today and we can look at these messages and preach about the characteristics of our great high priest, Jesus Christ. And we can shout, we can hoot, and we can holler and say, wow, that's Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. But if we don't understand why it's so important for us to build upon Jesus Christ and to see Jesus in the light that God has painted him in, then we don't, then we miss the point of the description. And that is, you see, the Bible says that for him who believes all things are possible. That's in Mark, the ninth chapter. What is it that we base our beliefs on? The Bible calls Jesus Christ the cornerstone. We stand on Jesus. He is what we base our beliefs on. So when we build our cornerstone up, when we begin to see Jesus Christ in the light and the description and the characteristics that God has painted the picture of, the bigger Jesus gets, the bigger our foundation is, the stronger our foundation is, which means the more firm our belief is, which means the more effective our life is. 
You got to get it. Listen, listen, listen. Hey, hey, hey. If you get anything, get this. The bigger we see who Christ is, the bigger we see Jesus, the bigger we realize how much we are in him. The more we see about Christ, the more we realize about who we are in Christ. So it's not just a message about building up and shouting and hooting and hollering about who Jesus Christ is and how great he is. We already know that. But when we see these descriptive factors about our great high priest, now all of a sudden we can look and pull some truths out about who and what we are in Christ. And therefore, we can live our lives called according to the purpose of the will of God. We can now live an effective life because when we see who Christ is, we see who we are in Christ. Are you with me this morning? So today, we're going to take a look at these five characteristics of our great high priest. Characteristics of our high priest. Five characteristics of our high priest. Number one, out of Hebrews, the 7th chapter, the 26th verse. Number one, the Bible describes Jesus, our high priest, as holy. When we define the term holy, we use the word oftentimes like this, exclusively God's. To be holy is to be exclusively God's. To be entitled or completely aligned and by no other means with God. Much like a marriage. When you are married and when you get up there on that, on that uh, altar and you exchange vows, you become exclusively each other's. A holy marriage is two people joined together. That's why God even uses the example or the illustration of marriage as our relationship with Jesus Christ. But in that marriage, when somebody removes that exclusivity and begins to talk and, and, and converse with somebody else, all of a sudden there's a problem in that marriage and it is no longer the way it was designed by God. So the Bible describes Jesus Christ, our great high priest, as holy, exclusively God's. In terms of action, in terms of life, holiness means to be righteous, to be right standing with God, to be able to comprehend and to do what God has called us to do. So in being holy and exclusively God's, Jesus Christ stood to be righteous, to love what God loved and to hate what God hated, to draw the line in the sand and say, this is my allegiance, I have no allegiance elsewhere, therefore I will focus on God. What an example that God gave us through Jesus Christ to be righteous. You see, nobody knows God better than God. Just like nobody knows me better than me. Nobody knows you better than you. So if God wants to show us the example of being exclusively His, of being completely righteous or in right standing with God, He sent for us Jesus Christ, a part of Himself, to come and live on the world to show us the example of righteousness and holiness. Why? Because nobody is more right standing with God than God. So Jesus Christ is described as holy in Psalms. The 45th chapter, the psalmist is writing a prophetic statement about Jesus Christ, the Messiah, describing the, the, the Messiah in Psalms, the 45th chapter, verse number 7. It says about the Messiah, you, you love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you, speaking of Jesus, with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Jesus Christ was in such right standing and holiness with God that he said, I love what is God's, I hate what is not, and I will not go any other direction but to be in complete right standing with God. I am exclusively God's, no one else's. And because of it, he was anointed more than his companions, anybody that had gone before him. Jesus Christ, our great high priest, is holy. But what does that mean for you and I? How does that apply to you and I in our lives? Well, look what it says in 1 Peter. 1 Peter, the first chapter, I'll put it up on the overhead for you. 1 Peter, in the first chapter, it says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Peter said, hey, tighten the belt of your brain, all right? You got to gird it up. You got to hold on to it, man. You got to get yourself together. Be sober, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse number 14 goes on to say, As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance... I love this, verse number 15. But as he who called you, Jesus Christ, is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. 
Now, I love this. Verse number 16 gives us the, the pathway to it. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. You see, God told the children of Israel in the law, you must be holy because I, God, am holy. But before Jesus Christ, we had to live according to law, according to religion, according to rule. But Jesus Christ came. Jesus Christ set the example like a great teacher. Didn't just say, do as I say, not as I do. Jesus Christ said, do as I say and do. And it's because Jesus Christ was exclusively God's, it was because he came to this earth and lived a perfect spotless life that he showed us the pathway that we could and his enabling grace allows you and I to do and to live according to the will of God, no longer on the outside, but now we can fulfill the word of God that was written that was once impossible, and that is you and I can be holy, exclusively God's, because Jesus Christ, our great high priest, whom we are in, is holy. It is through the power of Jesus Christ that you and I can be holy. Amen? We're talking about characteristics of our high priest. Jesus Christ, number one, is holy. Number two, characteristics of our high priest. Number two, harmless. Harmless. Some translations, like the New Living Translation, use the word blameless. Jesus Christ is blameless. Oftentimes, speaking of the subject of the, of the high priest being the middleman or the representative, Oftentimes we think of middlemen. You know, in our day and age, we don't necessarily like middlemen. Now, some of you work in a position where you are a, a middleman, maybe a car salesman or something like that, and, and we sure do appreciate you. We, we, we drive on the road because of you, or despite you. Um, no, I'm just kidding. We love, we love our friends that are in the automotive industry. But oftentimes you wonder, what is the motive of the middleman? Are they looking out for my best interest, or are they looking out for their best interest? When you're buying a car and you're sitting at that table, and the car salesman, you work it out and say, okay, this is my price. You know, they do, they draw the little box and they give you all the numbers. You say, this is what I want to pay. Oh, okay, let me go talk to my boss. And they go talk to the sales manager and they come back and, well, okay, they said, this is my price. Okay, let me go. And you back and forth, back, you know, you wonder, what is their motive? What is behind their intentions? The Bible describes Jesus Christ, our great high priest, as harmless as blameless. You and I don't have to worry about the motives, about the intentions of Jesus Christ. Why? Because clearly through the life that he lived, through the words that he taught, through the things that he did, through his life exemplified, Jesus Christ came with our best intentions in mind. And when we have that understanding of who Jesus Christ is, then we can understand that we have the ability to put our trust fully and wholly upon him. Why? Because we don't have to question, well, what if I give Jesus Christ my hopes, my wills, my wants, my desires? What if he takes them and turns them around? You don't have to worry about that. Why? Because he is God Almighty and he is harmless. The Bible describes him as blameless. He has pure motives. Those motives are your best intentions. With that thought in mind, you and I are now able to put our entire life in his hands, to trust him with our children, to trust Him with our finances, with our jobs, with our well-beings, with our dreams, with our desires, with our hopes, with our wants. To trust Him with every ounce of our being. Why? Because we know that He is not here to bring us harm, but rather to bring us life, to bring us life more abundant. We know that our High Priest has us in His mind. Jesus says... My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Come to me, you who are heavy laden. I will, I, I will give you peace. I will give you rest. We know that his intentions are for us. Jesus in Matthew, the 10th chapter, as he sent his disciples out, told his disciples, Behold, I send you as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be uh, wise as serpents and harmless as doves. This is the practical application for you and I in understanding the attributes of Jesus. He did not come to condemn, he said in John the third chapter, but to give us life, to redeem, to renew, to save. Jesus could have come and showed us the depravity of mankind, the disgust of human nature, but rather Jesus came to redeem. Therefore, in following our leader, in following suit for whom we are in, Jesus Christ, we have got to understand that our motives for the world around us is to not bring harm or offense to those around us, but to become harmless as doves. 
He says to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. That means that we're not to be pushovers, that we're not to allow the world to mow us over or mow us down, but at the same time to use our words, to use our will, to use our actions wisely to glorify God, not ourselves. I don't know about you. I have an, an amazing talent to rip somebody apart with words. I mean, I, I just, I can really lay into somebody. God has given me that talent. <laughs> but you see the motives of Jesus Christ, me ripping into somebody, me telling somebody about how bad they were or how much they hurt me, does that benefit them or does that benefit me? Jesus Christ came to benefit us, therefore our motive in life should be to benefit those around us. He says to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Have you ever seen an attack dove? You know those guys that have the big leather gloves and they have the falcon or, falcon or the eagle and they go and they get the rabbit or they go and get the... I mean, it's a really cool, neat thing that they do. I mean, these big old claws and beaks that just tear flesh apart. You ever seen a guy with a big leather glove with a dove? Sick him. Go get him. There's no offense. There's no harm that comes when you see a pigeon on the side of the road. You don't stop in awe for that bird. It's not majestic. It's harmless. Our administrator calls them rats with wings. And Jesus Christ says to be somebody that doesn't bring offense to those around. To use your words wisely. To use your motives wisely. Could you imagine what businesses would be like in the Christian world if we as Christians operated with everybody's best intent? Like Jesus Christ who came to us did. Oftentimes we say, well, I don't want to do business with somebody in the church because I've, I've heard about that stuff. I'd rather just stay outside of it altogether. Could you imagine what life would be like as Christians, as businesses, as families, as friends, as co-workers, as, as, as fellow human beings, if we would live our life like Jesus lived for us with the motives and the interior to, 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 to build people around us rather than tear them down? The Bible tells us that our great high priest was harmless. You and I have got to be harmless to build people up to not tear them down. We're talking about characteristics of our high priest, number three today. Number three, characteristics of our high priest, undefiled. The Greek translation of that word undefiled literally means to be untainted or uncontaminated. Jesus Christ was uncontaminated from the things of this world. Genealogically speaking, Jesus Christ was removed from the lineage of sin. That's why He was born of a virgin. Through the Holy Spirit and Mary, Jesus Christ came without the bloodline of man inside of Him, therefore was free from the lineage of sin. Jesus Christ was uncontaminated in this world. But you know the interesting thing about Jesus Christ being physically uncontaminated was is that Jesus realized that it wasn't what was on the outside that defiled a man, he said, but it's on, it's on the inside. And in his position, Jesus Christ being described as our high priest, the religion of those days, the high priest of those days, would never touch, would never go near, would set up safeguards to stay away from things that would defile them, that would cause them to be contaminated. Pastor Dan used the example a few weeks ago of the Good Samaritan and the priest that walked by on the other side of the road. It was illegal for him to touch somebody in that condition, to touch the dead, to touch the sick, to be in the midst of the grime and the dirt and the filth of the world. They had to remove themselves, but Jesus understood that it wasn't about the outside. It wasn't about the condition of somebody's skin. It wasn't the condition of their story, but it was the inside. Jesus Christ touched the leper. Jesus Christ healed the sick. He spent time with those who needed to be spent time with. Why? Because he realized that it wasn't about the outside. He wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty for you and I. The Bible tells us, so go and put it up on the overhead. 2 Corinthians, for God made him, speaking of Jesus, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Do you understand the, the gravity of this verse? For God made Jesus not to sin, not to live a life of sin, but to be, God made him who was perfect from sin to become sin on our behalf. Jesus Christ was completely clean, untainted, uncontaminated from the things of this world, yet God made him to become sin for us so that you and I could now live righteousness in right standing with God through Jesus Christ. 
It's because we have a high priest that is spotless. It's because we have a representative that doesn't deal with the issues that we dealt with, that was uncontaminated by the world, that you and I can understand that it's not about the outside, but it's about the inside. Through Jesus Christ, we are cleansed from the inside out. We are a new creation. As Christians, what that means to you and I is that we should not be afraid to get our hands dirty for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus came from the highest of classes and ministered to the lowest of lows. It's not about status. It's not about appearance. It's not about look. It's not about preference. It's about Jesus Christ. He came and he ministered to those who needed to be ministered. Church, you and I have got to understand that we cannot be afraid to get out there and get our hands dirty for the gospel of Jesus Christ because God himself did it for us. We're talking about characteristics of our high priest. Number four today, characteristics of our high priest. Number four, he is separate from sinners. Separate from sinners. Now the Greek word of this word separate literally defined means to be divorced, to withdraw from. Jesus Christ, if you want to describe it like this, as our great high priest was divorced from sin, withdrawn from you see, we think of this separate from sinners, and we can look at that and say, well, well, well Pastor Luke, clearly he, 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 he was separate. He, he wasn't there. He didn't go there. I, I'm not going to go. I'm going I'm I'm to I'm keep that at arm's length. But if you look at the life, the example of our great high priest, Jesus Christ, if you were to look for him in his day, if you were there, you would find Jesus Christ in the company of sinners. The religious, the Pharisees, the priests, the Sadducees, the scribes, They always found offense because Jesus was with the ones that religious, that law, that rule said you shouldn't be around. I wouldn't make any point to hang around them, but yet Jesus had them for dinner. Over for dinner. He didn't have them for dinner. He had them over for dinner. (laughs) Jesus spent time in the company of sinners. He made them his disciples. The whole time the world tried to influence Jesus Christ to sin, but they were never able to. The whole time the devil tried to influence Christ to sin, but he was never able to. But rather, Christ, because he was separated, he was divorced. Even though he spent time with sinners, he was always divorced from sin. The world tried to influence him, but they never could. But yet he influenced the world for the kingdom of God. You see, church, you and I have got to understand that we have got to be divorced from who we once were. Word. Now, I'm not telling you to go home and divorce something or somebody. Uh-uh, okay? Not going there. What I am saying is that who you once were, you no longer are. And in a divorce, you sever the tie. You don't hang on to it. You don't keep staying there. You get out. You split it up. You deal with it. You move on. And and Jesus Christ was divorced from sin as our great high priest, our leader, and who we are in Christ. Jesus Christ, through the grace of God, has given us the ability to separate, to divorce from who we once were so that now we can look to Christ and see who we are and travel in the direction of Jesus Christ and be holy as he is holy, to love righteousness and hate wickedness. Why? Because we no longer are bound to sin. But we are separated from it. Doesn't mean we separate from the sinner. Doesn't mean we separate from that. Doesn't mean that we develop communities with high walls where we don't let anybody. No, that's not the plan of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the plan of God is designed to be spread through you and I. You might be the only gospel somebody in your family, in your job, in your circle of influence ever sees because it is the plan, the will, the desire of God through Jesus Christ that you shine the glorious light that they might come to know God. You are living examples of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Therefore, you are to be divorced from sin, but not to withdraw from the world. Jesus Christ told of his disciples that they are in this world, right, but not of it. We are divorced from sin. Looking at the characteristics of our high priest, last one for this morning, Jesus Christ, my favorite one of them all, exalted, lifted above the heavens. Jesus Christ came with humble beginnings, born in a manger. You see, Jesus didn't come to the royal bloodlines. Jesus didn't come in a palace. Jesus didn't come with a legion of armies behind him saying, I'm going to do this. We're going to, we're going, I'm going to show everybody how great and how wonderful. No, he came with humble beginnings. He lived the life of a carpenter's son. 
a humble life. He died a humble and humiliating death for our behalf. But I love it because the Bible says that he is exalted, lifted above the heavens. Jesus Christ, our great high priest, is exalted. Look what it says in Revelations in the fifth chapter. Revelation in the fifth chapter. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Speaking of Jesus Christ, look at the description the Bible paints for our high priest, our cornerstone on which we stand. Who was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. Jesus Christ was blessed with all that could be blessed. He was exalted with all that could be blessed or exalted. Jesus Christ received all that could be received. Why? Because he is our great high priest. He is the power above powers, the name above names, the principality above principalities, things that are named and that are not named. Jesus Christ is exalted above the heavens, which means that he is high, seated at the throne of God, making intercession for us. And when we understand that he has been exalted by all. <gasps> what does that do for the foundation that you and I stand on in Jesus Christ? He is greater than all. When our cornerstone, when our foundation is unshakable, that means that our faith is unshakable. That means that our belief is unshakable. That means that our life is unshakable. Now all of a sudden the statements that Jesus gave us about building on the rock makes sense because when the storms of life come, we realize that the rock that we build on is based in the heavens that has been exalted, that has been glorified, that has been given everything that can be given, that is above every power and principality. Now all of a sudden we realize that there is nothing that can unearth that rock that we stand on. Jesus Christ, our great high priest. Then the Word of God becomes alive that says we are more than conquerors. When the Word of God says that through Christ I can do all things, now all of a sudden, because He is glorified, because He is lifted high, now all of a sudden these become alive to us. These statements. Philippians in the second chapter says, I'll put it up on the overheads for you. Therefore God elevated Him, speaking of Christ, to the place of highest honor, gave Him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. I love this. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. You know what that means? That means no matter where you go, you can't escape it. That means no matter where you go, the authority, the power, the blessing, the honor, the exaltation that Jesus Christ has received in heaven is inescapable. The stretches of the universe above, below, everywhere you go, every knee shall bow. To the name of Jesus Christ. And the Bible goes on to say, verse number 11, every tongue confess to the glory of our Lord. Praise God, Jesus Christ. What does that mean for you and I? What does that mean for you and I that our high priest is exalted? Well, obviously we talked about the, the encouragement that this is our cornerstone in which we believe in. But think about it like this. Jesus Christ came humbly, lived humbly, died humbly, but was exalted at the end of it all. You and I as Christians, you and I as the church have got to understand we cannot go through life without being heaven-minded. We don't live for today. We don't live for what we can achieve and what we can grab a hold of and what we can buy and what we can spend on and what we can be associated with today. Why? Because we are not minded for the things of today. We are headed through our inheritance of Jesus Christ to be glorified and exalted and lifted up into heavenly places to spend eternity with our great high priest, Jesus Christ in paradise forever. Christians, church, we have got to always remember to be heaven-minded. We focus on heaven heaven. That is our goal. Don't lose sight of the goal because that is where we are headed through Jesus Christ, our great high priest. All because Jesus is a perfect fit for each and every one of us. All because God saw fit to fill every nook and cranny we needed to be filled. All because God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live amongst us so that we could live according to his will. I love what 1 John 4, 17 says. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. We may be able to stand before God because as he is, so are we in this world. Because he is holy, so are we in this world. 
Because he's harmless, so are we in this world. Because he's unspotted, because he is divorced from sin, so are we in this world. Because he is exalted, so will we be. Love is perfected. We can stand before God with encouragement. Colossians in the first chapter will conclude with this thought. The Bible speaks what it speaks of Jesus. It speaks over you. Colossians in the first chapter, verse number 21, says, And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by the wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, because of the grace of Jesus Christ is what it's saying, to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach. What the Bible describes our great high priest, Jesus Christ, holy, blameless, harmless, unspotted, untainted, uninfluenced by the things of this world, divorced from the sin, now you and I can live a life like Jesus Christ. He is a perfect fit. All we have to do is realize how great He is to realize how great we can be in Him. When the Bible says through Christ, I can do all things, we can do all things because Jesus Christ is all things to us. Did you guys get something out of the Word of the Lord today? <laughs> Praise God. And I want to do one more thing. I want to just take the moment to challenge you to look into your life. I want to ask you something. The Bible says that a man ought to examine himself from time to time. So let me ask you a question. I want you to challenge your own heart, your own life. I want to ask you this question. What makes you think you're going to get to heaven? What makes you think or what makes you so sure that you're going to get to heaven? Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you are a good person, because you do good deeds, you're going to get to heaven? Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you go to church, because your parents told you you were a Christian, because you sit in the service, because you memorize some scripture, because you volunteer, carry the pastor's Bible, something like that, that you're going to get into heaven? Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God does it say that you get to heaven because of that? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're a Christian, does a baby, you're baptized, or attended Sunday school or Sabbath school classes means you're going to get to heaven. Nowhere, you can't find that in the Word of God. Oftentimes we think, oh, Pastor Luke, you know, I'm a spiritual person. I believe in, in heaven, so therefore I'm, I'm, I'm going to go. You know, nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you think you're a spiritual person, because you believe that there might be a heaven, means that, that, that you're going to find yourself there by chance. You can't get to heaven there. Ultimately, what it boils down to is you and I can't get to heaven in any other way but God's way. Why? Because it's God's heaven. The only way to get there is God's way. Jesus Christ said to a man by the name of Nicodemus in John, the third chapter, speaking of the subject of heaven, of eternal life. Nicodemus was a religious leader. Nicodemus had memorized the word of God. Nicodemus wore the right clothes. He gave to the poor, did all the right things, said all the right things. In terms of outward appearance, Nicodemus was about as good as it gets. And in the conversation of eternal life, Jesus and Nicodemus are having this conversation. And Jesus says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, in order to get to heaven, you must be born again. There it is. See, it's God's heaven, it's God's way. The only way we can get there is God's way. And Jesus Christ lays it out and he says that you must be born again. You know, Hollywood, popular culture, society's taking that term born again. You think of weirdo, crazy, out of control, Christianity. But let me tell you something. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, in the terms of, of born again in God's eyes, it's always meant the same thing. Here it is. It means that you've given God all of your life, given God all of your heart. It's not about your mental ascent of who God is or your carnal knowledge of who God is. You know why? The Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who God is, yet they're not going to go to heaven. The Bible shows us that the devil knows scripture, quoted it to Jesus in the time of the temptation, yet the devil's not on his way to heaven. So because you think you know who God is or you know who Jesus Christ is, doesn't mean that you're going to get to heaven. Because you've memorized John 3, 16 or some other verses, doesn't mean you're going to get to heaven. You can only get there God's way. Jesus Christ said you have to be born again. Born again simply means this. You've given God all of your heart. You've given him all your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. Let me prove it to you. In the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church. He says to the church, when I come back, I better find you cold or hot. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Ooh, shocking statement from the mouth of Jesus Christ. And what he's saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Well, let's define that in terms of your walk with God. Lukewarm, as far as your relationship with Jesus Christ, means that you're a little bit in, you're a little bit out, a little bit up, a little bit down. Occasional church attendance, token prayer, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, doing some, some of your own thing, doing some of God's thing. You're riding the fence. You're not wholehearted for God. You're not wholehearted against God. Jesus Christ says if that's you, you're deceived in thinking that you're going to make it into the kingdom of God. Listen, let me love you enough. Let me respect you enough. Let me honor you enough to tell you the truth, to tell you like it is, to so not beat around the bush. 
You're not going to get to heaven based on your own devices. You're not going to get to heaven based on how good you look on the outside or how good you can speak or how, how much charity you give to. You're not going to get to heaven because you sit in church and listen to the pastor speak. You're not going to get to heaven because you sing in the choir. The only way you get there is God's way, and that's because you've given him all your heart. You've given him all your life. You see, Jesus Christ said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one goes to the Father except through him. We can't get there any other way but God's way. So today, how do we do this? How do we get in there? How do we make sure today that we're going to spend eternity with God? You know, you might even say, well, Pastor Luke, to be honest with you, I don't know about heaven. I don't know about hell. I'm not sure if they're real or not. Listen, let me tell you something. Just because you can't see something because you can't feel it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Come on, we know that. You can't see the air that you breathe. You can't see the radio waves and the microwaves that fly through the air that go to your cell phone every, each, and, each and every moment, but yet you know they exist. Heaven is a real place. Hell is a real place. Real enough for God to tell us about it. Real enough for Jesus Christ to teach us about it. Real enough for you and I to stop playing games with God and take it serious. The decision's yours. Let's not do this any other way but God's way. Not do it some well-meaning church committee or author's way. Today, let's do it God's way. And Jesus Christ said this. He said, if you confess him before men, he will confess you before his Father. But if you deny him, he will deny you before his Father. You see, the decision is totally and wholly yours. And Jesus Christ is looking for your decision today. What are we going to do? In just a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, three. I'm going to go bang! Smack my hand on my Bible just like that. And when I do, I want to give you the opportunity when I smack my hand on my Bible, bang, just like that. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to pop your hand up. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Luke, I want to make sure I get into heaven. Pastor Luke, I want to give Jesus Christ all of my heart. I want to give him all my life. I, don't, I, I want to make sure today. You say, well, well, if I raise my hand, I'm going to be embarrassed. Somebody that I came with, they're going to see me. They're going to know. Listen, let me tell you something. You might very well be embarrassed or feel an embarrassment because of that. But let me encourage you to shed that. This isn't a time about you or about your feelings, your emotions. This is the moment of your salvation. Jesus Christ said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. I'm a man, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it. Get over that moment of embarrassment for an eternity in heaven. It's a trade-off that nobody would make. The decision's yours. Who should raise their hand in just a moment? We'll do it all together. If you've never given him your heart, you've never given him your life, in just a moment, when I count to three, get your hand up. I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. We'll go forward from there. Who should raise their hands? Maybe you're not sure. Maybe you did this at a Harvest Crusade or as a child, but you never really followed through or followed up with it today. Hey, let's make this the day you go forward in your relationship with God and make sure. Don't walk out of here today without making sure. Come on, that's a gamble you can't afford to make. Finally, who should raise their hands today? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, hey, this is the day for you to ensure your place with God in heaven forever and ever and ever, leaving, the hell, be uh, leaving hell behind divorcing yourself from who you once were and now becoming who God has called you to be. This is your moment. This is the time of your salvation. Get ready in just a moment. All over this auditorium, from the front to the back, in the family rooms, whether you're watching in the Love Rock Cafe or in the foyer, wherever you're at, you hear the sound of my voice. This is the moment of your salvation. Don't let it pass you by. The Bible says it's the goodness of God that draws men into repentance. It's not about man. It's not about the person next to you, in front of you, behind you. It's about you and God right now. This is your moment. This is your time. Get ready. I'm going to count to three in just a moment. If that's you, pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down, and we'll go forward today. Let's ensure your place in heaven forever and ever and ever, leaving hell behind. It's your decision. Here we go. I'm going to count. Wherever you're at, get ready. Hands all over this place. Get ready. This is your moment. Here we go. Ready? One, two, Three. Let me see your hands in this place. I got you. One, two, three. All right, where are you at? Let me see your hands if you got your hands up. Three wise people. Where are you? Anybody else? I saw some hands in the four. I got you back there. You raise your hand, but I didn't see. Come on, I got to see it. Where are you at? Four wise people. Five. I see you right over there. Six. I got you. Six wise people. Anybody else in this place? You say, man, I wonder if I should. I want to give them out. Seven. I got you right there. Seven. One. Eight. I see you back there in the back. Eight wise people in the family rooms. I see that hand. Nine. Where are you at? You say, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. Come on, this is your moment. This is your time. Don't let it pass you by. Spirit of God's on your heart right now, speaking to you, telling you to get your hand up. Come on, get your hand up. Don't start the first few moments of your potential eternal life with God in disobedience. Anybody else? Nine wise people. I didn't embarrass them. I'm not going to embarrass you. Anybody else in this place today? Saying, I wonder if I should. You should. Come on. Wherever you're at. Anybody else? Nine wise people. I'm going to close it up in just a second. Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, praise God for the nine wise people. Hallelujah.
Here's what we're going to do. In just a moment, we're all going to stand. Elijah's going to sing a song, as we do. For those of you that raise your hand, whether you're in the family room, the ushers will come and they'll help you get your stuff, get your kids, all your stuff. They'll come help you get out of there. Whether you're in the family room, you're in the front, the back, wherever you're at, you said you were going to give them all your heart. You said you were going to give them all your life. You don't do that by raising your hand. You acknowledge that you want to do it. You do that by making Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. Let us help you. Let us pray with you. Get some information into your hands. Get us some tools into your hands to live an effective and solid life. So here's what we're going to do in a moment. We're going to stand. As we do, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, your friend if you need a friend. If you came with somebody or somebody brought you or you brought somebody, look at them and say, go with me. And come and let's change destinies up here. Come meet me up here at the altar and let's change destinies together. As we stand, please nobody leave. If that's you, if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, get out of your seat, get out of your chair, and let's come change destinies together today. That's you. Wherever you're at, you come. Come on. You're all my life. You're all I need. So take all these Come on. If that's you, you come. To Wherever you're at, come on. Sing and look. Praise God, you guys came. Hey, listen, today is the first day of the rest of your life. You're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. Today's the day to celebrate. It's a good thing, all right? Here's what I want to do. I'm going to introduce a friend of mine to you. This guy right over here waving at you, Pastor Joel, all right? Like Noel, Joel, all right? He's going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. Listen, I promise I am as weird as it gets. You got through me, okay? He's going to take you right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer so you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. He's going to give you some free literature, some easy reading just to help get you strong, to help you understand the decision that you've made. The third thing he's going to do is he's going to give you a friend. We give away friends here at the Rock Church. They're called spiritual personal trainers. Like a personal trainer at the gym helps you get strong, make sure you're doing the right things. A spiritual personal trainer, somebody that will meet with you right before church. They'll buy you a cup of coffee for five weeks, teach you some things about the Word of God so that you get strong, you don't go back to the life that you came from, and you go forward in your relationship with God. So if you guys would just turn to your left, my right, go right over here with Pastor Joel. Praise God. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.